people of God, according to the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, my dear son, grace, mercy and peace from God the Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. I thank God whom I serve, as my forefathers did, with a clear conscience, as night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers. Recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I have been reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and, I am persuaded, now lives in you also. For this reason, I remind you to fan the flames, the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God did not give us a spirit of humility, of humi timidity, timidity, sorry, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. So do not be ashamed to testify about our Lord, or ashamed of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Saviour, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immor immortality to light through the gospel. And of this gospel, I am appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. That is why I'm suffering as I am. Yet I am not ashamed because I know whom I have, who I have believed and I'm convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him for that day. Whatever you heard from me, keep as the pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. This is the word of the Lord. I invite Tim to come up to pray for you. Lord, we thank you for Tim. We thank you for the words you've given him to speak to us this morning. May our hearts be open to receive and our ears be open to hear. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you. I love making fire. <laughs> I don't know what it is about setting it up and just hoping everything will work. Since coming to Luton, Amanda and I have bought a chimney, and we really enjoy getting the logs out, getting the kindling in, lighting it, and seeing, will it take? Will it light? It probably helps that afterwards we usually toast marshmallows on it. I hope I can get a fire set up today for the barbecue that we're hoping to have if the weather holds out across the road. We need heat. We need that heat to cook. So it can be, we need that heat to be really, really good. But of course, as we all know, fire can also be very deadly. But it is something that as it gets lower, and what we've noticed as a chimney is it gets lower and it dwindles. You just see the embers flickering. And to get that fire to ignite again, you have to breathe on it. Bring the oxygen, the whole fire triangle. I'm not quite sure about how it works, but you breathe on it. And then you add another log, and it brings it back to life. And the fire lights up again. And then you can toast more marshmallows on it, or cook more burgers, or whatever you do. We often talk about the Holy Spirit in terms of fire. We think of Pentecost. We hear of the tongues of fire resting on those gathered in the room. And often when people are receiving from the Holy Spirit, they feel warm. They feel a warmth. It may be as you're holding your hands out, a sign of openness and receiving to God, that you feel fire in your hands. You might feel it right there. It might be in your heart. It might not be that at all. You might not feel it at all. It can sometimes, when you feel that fire in your hands, be a sign that God is asking you to pray for healing for someone. On occasions when I've prayed for healing for people, 
I put my hand on them and I feel a fire or I feel a warmth go from me into the person. That's the Holy Spirit, the fire of the Holy Spirit. It's not me doing anything with the fire. It's God working through me. But we also need to make sure that we keep a check on our own spiritual lives, on the fire of the Holy Spirit within each of us. And I wonder this morning, how are you feeling in that? Do you feel that the Holy Spirit is alive, burning within you? Or do you feel like it's just got down to those dull embers and it needs God's breath to breathe on it again and spark it back into life for you? Well, however you're feeling, I think the passage we had this morning from 2 Timothy comes as a great encouragement to all of us. After all, Paul is urging Timothy to rekindle God's gift, to bring it back to that blazing fire, to light those embers, to allow God to breathe on it, to light that fire back into life. Something is clearly glowing inside Timothy, and Paul is encouraging him to bring it back to life. Now, we don't know precisely what that gift was that Paul refers to. But I think in many ways, that's what makes it relevant to me and to you today. Because it's not saying it's about one specific thing. It's the gift of God. If Paul was to say, the gift of you in church leadership, well, that applies to those in leadership. But what about those that aren't? If Paul were to say those with, that, can, that are healing, that have gifts of healing, what about those that don't? He does, he's not descriptive about what gift it is because it makes, it makes it relevant to each one of us. But we have to rekindle it. We have to tend to that fire that burns deep within us. And to do that, I want to look at the reading we had today in two separate parts. Firstly, we're going to look at 1 to 7. And that is about rekindling those gifts. It's about getting back on fire for God. And then we're going to look at the second part, verses 8 to 14, which is about not being ashamed, not being ashamed of the gospel that we have been given. So for each and every one of us here today, we have a choice to make. We can use the gifts that God has given us, or we can leave them. We can either use them or we can leave them. That's the choice. We can't simply receive gifts from God and leave them to lie dormant. It doesn't work like that. We choose to receive from the Holy Spirit or we can choose not to. Now, I don't know about you, but I want to be in that first category. I want to be there receiving from the Holy Spirit, receiving all that God has for me. And I hope you will be too. That as we receive, that, those embers spark up. Maybe your fire is already burning brightly and you just want another log thrown on that fire to keep it going. That's what it's about. That's what the reading's about, this first part. The embers being fanned into flame so that we are on fire and alive for God. But don't let those gifts that you have lie dormant. So I want to encourage you to stir up the Holy Spirit within you. Stir up those gifts that are within you. You may be thinking, but I don't quite feel in the right place today. No disrespect to the worship team. Maybe the songs we sung didn't quite do it for me today. But we can never wait for the right moment. If we keep waiting for that right moment, for that right song to come on, for the right word to be delivered. We're missing out on so much. So we can't always wait for the right feeling. Sometimes if we do, that moment when we wait, it passes us by. We don't want to do that either. We need to be open to God. We need to allow him to, we need to, allow him to prompt us to respond. We need to allow him to have our hearts and our minds open to receive from him wherever it is. And we can only do this when we're fully surrendered to him. We can only do this when we give everything to him. I was struck as we sung, 
hungry this morning. I'm falling on my knees, giving all I am. I know that is not the, exactly the right words. That's my paraphrase. But that's the sense that we're giving all to God so that he, we can receive from him. On Thursday, I met with other church leaders from Luton at Hope Church, and we prayed for our town and our country. Mike Jones led us, and the first thing he asked us to do was to share a story of when God really impacted our lives, when we were really touched deeply by God. There was one rule. We weren't allowed to talk about our ministry. We weren't allowed to talk about our church. It had to be something personal to us. Now, you may be thinking sometimes, well, ministry, leadership, it is all personal. It can be. But he was basically saying, think of a point when you really had an impact. God really impacted you. Well, I shared some of my story that morning, last Thursday, and I felt as I was preparing for today that it was right to share some of that story with you about when I was really impacted by God. Because I think it fits in with the reading. As you know, uh, when the Archdeacon outed all of my secrets at the licensing, I used to work as a lawyer in Leeds. Things were going really, really well. I had a training contract, which meant I could qualify as a solicitor. I got that training contract in September 2010, and it was due to start in September 2012. Everything was going really, really well. It was, I was like, yep, this is definitely what I want to do. I know this is right. Fantastic. I finally got that training contract. It had taken four years to get there. But it was shortly after I got that training contract when things started going downhill quite quick. And it all stemmed from a case that my boss had given me. And it was to do with a cleaner at a church. And he was trying to claim constructive dismissal. I'm not going to go into the law, but constructive dismissal is one of the hardest claims to bring at an employment tribunal. It is very, very hard. And the case, when I looked at the facts, was a 50-50. Now, I, I went to my boss and said, well, I'm a Christian, you know that. If this comes down to 50-50, I can't be impartial on this because I'm probably going to side with the church because I know how much churches struggle with finance, with money, you know, with, with dealing with all of this HR stuff. I know how hard it can be. And he said, fine, that's the right thing to do. That's okay. Go and ring the client and explain. Well, I picked up the phone, said this to the client, and an hour and a half later, after having my ear chewed off, I finally ended the call. I did say goodbye. I didn't like cut him off. But he got very, very cross. And to cut a really long story short, he followed through our firm's complaints procedure because he's saying he wasn't happy at what I'd said. I delayed him by two weeks. They found in, in our favor, and he wasn't happy. So he went all the way up to the legal ombudsman. And they found in our favor as well. And so well, actually the individual, me, was right to do that because he couldn't have been impartial. We're not going to pass for any more than that. It was the right thing to do. So you'd think that would be the end of the story. But it wasn't. Because even though the ombudsman had found in our favor, my boss still said, it's a black mark against our department and it's your fault. He said, it's your fault. And that, those words really stung. It got to a point where things just deteriorated even more with my boss, and I ended up being signed off work. It was at that point when I realized that I hadn't surrendered everything to God. I realized that I'd surrendered everything but my career. I'd given my all to God, but I was quite happy to say, but you're not going to have that bit because I want to do that. That's what I'm, I'm going to do for the rest of my life. That's what my career is going to be. And it wasn't until I took that decision to say, I'm out, I'm leaving, before God could really work. And that's when things really changed for me. As a side note, it was so unusual for people to resign when they had a training contract lined up that my firm sent me to occupational health. And I had to spend an hour and a half convincing them that I was of sound mind to resign. <laughs> I'm not going to ask what your thoughts are on my soundness of my mind.
But that's how unusual it was for somebody to, I put on my email, I'm resigning, I don't know what I'm going to, but God has called me out of law. And that's why they sent me to occupational health. (laughs) But after I resigned, things moved really, really quickly. And then within a week or two, I'd got this job with the Navy. And I was offered the post, but I couldn't start that post when they wanted me to because I still had my notice period to work in law. So I picked up the phone, spoke to the HR team, and said, well, actually, I've got this new job. I really want to start. And they cut my notice period down from three months to one month, which meant I could start the job with the Navy on time. Now, I was still off sick at this time. And when we got to that point, at five, I remember it vividly, five o'clock on a Friday evening, I was on a venture, you know, cipher venture as a leader. It got to five o'clock on that Friday evening, and it was as if somebody did that and flicked a light switch in me. And I completely changed. All of those negative feelings went. And I came alive. It was the fire within me that was reignited at that moment. Now I'm not telling you that for you all to go and quit your jobs tomorrow. Don't hear me wrong. That's not the advice I'm giving you. But I wanted to just share that with you to show we have to surrender everything to God. For God to work. Obviously, if we don't surrender everything, we'll still work. But if we really want to see his power, we need to be 100% committed. Now, I'm not saying either that Timothy has let Paul down in the reading we had. But Paul is urging Timothy to rekindle that gift, to fan it into flame. So I wonder where this morning do you need to have God's spirit fan you into flame? To bring you to life. Because we're told in verse 7 that God doesn't give us a spirit of timidity. But a spirit of power, love and self-discipline. We're given the Holy Spirit to make us bold and to make us strong. So within our lives we need to be able to think clearly about what needs to be done. Where do we need to surrender to God? We of course look at ourselves and do We look at it with moderation and self-discipline. And as we do that ourselves and see, we, we look at ourselves, we can then look together as a community of God's people. And the self-discipline is very important because as we all know too well that within churches, there's often things such as promotion, self-promotion, jealousy, rivalries. Those are not things of God. They're things of the enemy. There's not a place for anything like that in God's house or indeed in the kingdom. So we do that by being rooted in our faith. Paul knows Timothy is rooted in his faith. He mentions his mother and his grandmother, Lois and Eunice. So I wonder this morning, who in your life has been the spiritual parent that's helped you on your journey? Who has helped to kindle those gifts of God in you? It might not have been your earthly parents. That's okay. Timothy's was. It might not be for you. Some of us have bad experiences. But if you think about it, I know that you will all have at least one person who you can think, they've made a difference to my walk with God. For me, in my early years, it was my mum and my eldest brother. But now I would say it's my old college tutor who I see about four times a year. So the people, our spiritual parents, do change over time. But we all need those people to help us kindle those gifts that God has given us. So I wonder, who are your spiritual parents? Or are you feeling like a spiritual orphan? Do you need to find somebody who you can talk to, who you can share your struggles with, who can ignite those gifts within you? And I encourage you to do that. But what we do see from the letter is that Paul knows the deepest roots of our faith lie in God. His will, his promise, his grace, mercy and peace, as well as God's gift of colleagues and friends. Paul is writing this from a life that's rooted in prayer to the one true God. It's out of that prayer that he writes this letter to Timothy. And it's a letter that doesn't comment on what God has done and is doing. 
It's actually designed to be a very part of that work. That's how important this is. So may that letter that was sent to Timothy, that inspired him, inspire us today as we read that letter. And I encourage you to carry on reading. Read that letter and think, that's relevant to me today. Paul is writing to me. And as you do that, allow God to minister to you. Allow God to show you where you need to surrender. Allow God to rekindle those gifts that he's placed in you. Because God is the ultimate gift giver and we all have them. And we will hopefully at some point look at what gifts we have. But ask God to show you where you need him to breathe into your life. As we do that, we then get that desire to be, go out and share the gospel. This is when I want to switch to the second part of the passage, verses 8 to 14. Because it's about not being ashamed. Now we need to remember that Paul was speaking to Timothy in what was a very strong honor and shame culture. Everyone knew how it worked. There were many things that could bring shame on a family. And you didn't want to be associated with them. But there was also a carefully graded system of social power and prestige. And those who were associated with power and honor would have expected to have been treated preferentially in shops and businesses. Whereas those that were from the shame would expect people to sneer at them. So where's Paul in all of this when he's writing this letter? Well, he's in prison. Paul is in prison. And I imagine it's not a prison like we've got today. But it would be much, much, much worse. And in some ways there is a bit of a stigma attached to imprisonment. It robs people of something fundamental. That freedom to come and go. To make your own decisions. To live your own life. Now this might surprise you, but I've been in prison twice. Before you start wondering, it was God was on both of our chaplaincy visits. But I've been, I've been into prison twice. And both times it has really deeply affected me. First time I was at Little Hay, Category C prison near Cambridge. Well, I've done the A1s. It was a week's placement. And on the Tuesday morning, we arrived and they said, oh, we're going to go down to solitary confinement. They said, oh, why don't you go in this cell? So I walked into this cell. Bang. And they slammed the door shut. I heard the lock click. And they said, right, we'll see you tomorrow. And I was like, what on earth am I in here all night? They hadn't warned us about this. And they did it to try and give us just that little bit of understanding what it's like. Believe me, it worked. I don't get claustrophobic, but in that eight by six cell, those walls closed in on me. Now, I was only in for about five minutes in that cell before they unlocked the door. But the sense of relief as they unlocked that door was immense. And that night, we'd done, we had a little service in the prison we left at 6 p.m. And I heard a call go out, prisoners to cells, prisoners to cells, roll call in 10 minutes. All words to that effect. And I said to the chaplain, I said, what's that all about? And he said, oh, well, they go back to the cells, the doors are locked, and they're in overnight. We returned the following morning at 9 a.m., just as they were released from their cells. That's 15 hours. What had I done in those 15 hours? I'd gone back to college, I'd had a meal with friends, I'd gone to the pub, I'd watched TV, I think, I'd gone to sleep, I'd got up, I'd cycled 15 miles, breathed in the fresh air, and I'd driven back to the prison. Yet those people that were there had been in that cell, that eight by six cell, for all of that time, sometimes sharing with one another. Second time I went, I went to Armley up in Leeds. It's a higher security prison. And I was only in for one day between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. And when 4 p.m. came, the sense of freedom as we left, because every single door was locked. There was barbed wire. There was bars absolutely everywhere. I got back in the car after that from Leeds and drove back to Bentham, which was an hour and a half. And I remember just praising God that I am free enough to do that. Why do I share this? 
Well, Paul was in prison for his faith. Our brothers and sisters in this world, in this day and age, are in prison for their faith. They're not ashamed of the gospel. They will stand there and face death and say, I believe in Jesus Christ. That's not being ashamed of the gospel. And I think that's what Paul is saying to us. Of course, it is an injustice that our brothers and sisters are in for their faith. And we can pray for them. And we can see what can we do to help them. But Paul says to Timothy, do not be ashamed to testify about our Lord. How often are we ashamed to share our faith with our friends? How often are we ashamed to share our faith with our neighbor, with those we work with? How often when we get those butterflies in our stomach, we think, not today, Lord, I, I'm, I'm, I'm scared. I'm right there. I was petrified of telling my best friend that I was a Christian because I thought that would be the end of our friendship. It wasn't. Our friendship went much deeper than that. Now, don't hear me wrong. I'm not trying to compare that experience with our brothers and sisters in prison. But I'm sure there are times when we can all sit here and think, actually, yeah, I should have shared my faith at that point, and I didn't. Paul tells us, do not be ashamed. Peter also tells us, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. And I love those two bits, those two verses, because they give me strength. We cannot be ashamed to share our faith with those whom we encounter. Because if we, as Christians, aren't sharing our faith, who is? It's a scary thought. We have to pass the faith on to those around us, as the apostles did, and it's gone down the generations. We need to be doing that as well so that it will carry on for many generations to come. So how do we not be ashamed? We can recognize and celebrate the power that Paul is speaking of. That power which has been revealed through Jesus Christ. That power that has destroyed death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Because friends, God's power overrides any earthly power. Paul's telling Timothy that he needs to look at the, on a shame culture, but not to match up to that, not to seek after that. Timothy needs to line up his honor and shame. We need to line up our honor and shame with the will of God. We need to go to God. And when we share the gospel, we're putting God's power to work in our own lives. It brings the promise of resurrection to us personally, that we will rise up with Jesus on the last day. And when we do that, our values are then turned upside down. There may be things that we are proud of that we are now ashamed of as we seek God's will. There may be things that we, we've done that we want to repent. That's why we come to church and we confess our sins and God will forgive us. But as God's power is put, is put to work in our lives, it goes back to that first point about having that gift rekindled. It's a, it's a full circle thing. As we receive God's power, it ignites the gifts within us and then we want to go and share the gospel. And how do we share the gospel? We have God's power in us and so the cycle goes on. It's all one thing. And at this time in our world, it's ever so more important for us not to be ashamed of the gospel message. We believe it. It's a message that hasn't changed in 2,000 years and won't change for another 2,000 years and many, many years after that. It will never change. As Josh said in his prayer this morning, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The gospel is the same yesterday, today, and forever. But of course, we do hear of people trying to change Scripture to, in, for their own meaning. But as a lecturer of mine used to say, well, I believe what I do because it's written in the Bible. And you won't convince me to change my view unless you can point to me in the Bible where it tells me I'm wrong. And I love that. Because his beliefs are all based on us, on Scripture. And that's where we should be. We place Scripture at the heart of what we do. It's why we believe what we believe. Of course, we allow the Holy Spirit to interpret the passage for our context. But yet the fundamental truth of the Bible will never change. And we shouldn't be ashamed of that. We can't be ashamed of the Bible. 
Paul goes to prison because of his belief in the gospel. Our brothers and sisters are persecuted for their belief in the gospel. Our culture in this country is one where biblical truths are being cast aside for popular opinion. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that being a Christian is easy. And we may find that that makes us unpopular as we speak out against these these beliefs that are coming into our system, against our popular opinion, as we hold on to the biblical truths. It makes me sad when I hear of cases that are coming up at the moment, well, from a while ago as well. Somebody dismissed for for offering to pray for someone. Somebody dismissed for wearing a cross at work. People bringing cases against bakers because they refuse to make a cake. They're standing up for the gospel. And that's what we need to do. And that's what Paul is urging Timothy to do. And through Timothy, it's urging us to do the same. We stand up for the gospel. We stand up for the biblical truths. Because as we look around, Christianity, it feels that it's being squashed. It's being pushed out of every angle of our society. So it's up to us, as brothers and sisters in Christ, to bring that back to the forefront of our society. So that people know what it's like to be a Christian. So that they know that we're not weird. We are normal in inverted commas. I say that for myself more than anybody else. But you get the point. As those gifts are rekindled in us, we can do nothing but share the good news. And we can't be ashamed of it. There is too much at stake. So that's why it's important to keep that gift fanned into flame to keep it alive within you. And I think, as I've said, that's why Paul writes the way he does. Because we have those gifts of light in us so that we can go into the world, that we can face the onslaught of secularization. But we can stand firm and steadfast in what we believe and not be ashamed of the gospel. So I wonder, this morning, I've raised quite a few questions, but is there something in you, an ember, that you want to have reignited? Is there a gift that you have that you haven't used for a while? And I want to create a little bit of space to allow you to pray into that. Allow God to breathe into you, to reignite something that may have died a long time ago. Something that may be an ember now. So that's the first thing. The second thing is maybe you've been ashamed of the gospel. Well, that's okay. We all have, if we're honest. But I believe that God is saying to us, it's okay. But now's the time to change. Now's the time to not be ashamed. So I wonder if either of those two things strike something with you. If you'd like to receive prayer, please do. I think there will be a space in a moment where you can come forward to receive prayer if you want. Stay in your seats or pray. But if something has impacted you, if you feel that you need that gift of light, you need to no longer be ashamed, please, I urge you, don't leave this place without receiving prayer. We'll create some space now. We'll leave some silence. Come forward if you like. Or at the end of the service, find one of us and pray. Or find, to ask the person next to you to pray with you. But don't, please, leave this space. If you feel that God is saying to you, it's time to reignite that gift. It's time to stop being ashamed of the gospel.